The following is a paid program. WFEA is not responsible and accepts no liability for any of its content. The opinions, views, and advice expressed during the show are solely those of its participants and not those of WFEA, its advertisers, or management, and should be used as such as every individual situation is different. It's time for On Call with Minuteman Health, bringing you an hour discussion with New Hampshire physicians and healthcare experts on topics ranging from specific medical conditions to our changing medical system. On Call with Minuteman Health, helping you understand healthcare. And now, here's your host, Scott Colby. Good morning, folks, and welcome to On Call with Minuteman Health. I'm your host, Scott Colby, and welcome to Wednesday. Um, Before we get started, I I have to share what I I consider a really funny story. Um, In the studio with me this morning is Dr. Marina Feldman. Dr. Feldman, good morning and welcome. Glad to be here. It's great to have you. So we were talking about Star Wars, and I mentioned just before we went on air that... um, that I was the target audience back in the 70s when the first one came out, and I never saw it. So now my wife and I are committed to seeing the first six episodes and then and then seeing the new one, and Heather shaking her head. She can't believe this. And so I turned to Dr. Feldman, who is, uh, is younger than me, uh, probably by a long shot, and I said, uh, I said, yeah, we're going to have to rent the first six. She goes, yeah, you mean stream. <laughs> so dating myself once again. So, Dr. Feldman, it's actually it's great to have you on this morning. And what we're going to be talking about is breast imaging. So let me introduce you to the listeners, and then we'll, we'll take it away. So Dr. Marina Feldman uh, it has her MD and MBA. She attended medical school at Tufts Medical School, where she also earned her MBA. She did her residency at... Maimonides Medical Center. Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn. I asked her to help me with that pronunciation. She is fellowship trained in breast imaging from Northwestern in Chicago, and she is board certified in diagnostic radiology. Dr. Feldman is the director of breast imaging and the co-director of the Elliott Breast Health Center here in Manchester on Queen City Ave. Once again, Dr. Feldman, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. That's great. So, you know, as I as I introduce physicians. Oftentimes a physician, well not oftentimes, but several times a physician will be fellowship trained. And I I realized as we were preparing this morning, as we were chatting, I don't really know what that means and I should. Could you explain for us what fellowship training means and why that's important? Because it is certainly a much higher level of training. Absolutely. So um, all doctors go to medical school, Mm -hmm. which is four years. After medical school, um, they do residency. Residency is in different specialties, and the duration of the residency depends on the specialty. Okay. So for radiology, I did a five-year residency after medical school. That's on the longer side, right? That's a little bit on the longer side, yes. Yeah. And following that, I did a one-year fellowship in breast imaging, which uh, means for a full year, um, we did just breast imaging, breast intervention, biopsies. So you really become a subspecialist in this area. Very, very specialized training. Correct. Great, great. Well, it's good to have you here. And certainly that level of ex- expertise in that clinical standard is, uh, is comforting, I'm sure, to your patients. So, um, so as, we, as we get into this, I think it's important we've had um, – a breast surgeon on in the past, and, and we've had um, the New Hampshire Breast Care uh, Coalition president on as well. But I want to take this in a little bit of a different direction. And I think the way, the best way to structure the show, Dr. Feldman, is to talk a little bit about uh, the Elliott Breast Health Center and what differentiates it, what the model is. And maybe let's just start with how do people get to your center? Sure. That's that's a great way to start. So at Elliott Breast Health Center, we are a comprehensive breast center. Mm-hmm. What that means is we have surgeons and radiologists, breast radiologists, under the same roof, in the same space. You walk through the same door, and you can see either. Mm-hmm. Um, many of our, we have four surgeons and three breast radiologists. Wow. Many of those are fellowship trained. All of them are dedicated just to this field. They don't do anything other than breast surgery. The breast radiologists don't do anything other than breast radiology, breast imaging, breast intervention. What also makes us different is the level of collaboration that being in such a close space allows us to have. Mm-hmm. So essentially every patient that comes in with a problem on a cen- uh, into our center, we work with the surgeons. We talk to the surgeons. It doesn't matter if their appointment is with imaging or 
clinical appointment with a surgeon, we collaborate, we pull each other aside. I can pull a surgeon aside, say this patient really needs Mm -hmm. to see you and needs clinical attention Mm -hmm. and vice versa. Right. So to your point, um, you know, a a breast radiologist will have that communication in in a setting other than yours with the surgeon and and with the care team. But this is unique in that you're housed in the same space. Correct. And that physical proximity facilitates better clinical communication, I would assume. Absolutely. And it's really, it's to the benefit of the patient. Often we discuss their case before they even leave their appointment. So I can only suppose that in a model like this, the patient doesn't feel as though they're being handed off as much as they're being cared for by a team? That is the goal. The goal is that it is we, the patient is the center of our care, mm-hmm. and we surround that patient. And actually, that extends through if a patient is diagnosed in, um, diagno- has a diagnosis of breast cancer, we have a true multidisciplinary approach. So once a week, um, breast radiologists, breast surgeons, breast pathologists, those are the doctors that actually interpret the biopsies. Okay. Um, our colleagues, uh, oncologists at uh, New Hampshire Oncology Hematology, Radiation Oncology Group, we work with Radiation Oncology Associates. Mm-hmm. Both of those groups are excellent. So once a week, we gather for a conference and we discuss every patient that was diagnosed. So they really have the benefit of everyone being in the same room and concentrating just on them. No phone tag, no email tag, no working things in between patients, but they really get our undivided attention. That's that's wonderful. You know, stepping back, Dr. Feldman, you have a very sobering statistic that you were able to pull up, I believe, from um, the State Department of Health and Human Services that um, where does New Hampshire rank in the incidence of breast cancer? I, I know the answer, <laughs> but for the benefit of so, our listeners. So um, the latest statistics that were put out by Department of Health and Human Services um, demonstrate that New Hampshire is number one, has number one incidence of breast cancer. Wow. The statistic the year prior to that, we were number two. So that is a very sobering statistic, especially when you look at the um, average age of the population. It is really important that women have their screening mammograms. Because we're older, you're saying, Dr. Feldman? That's what the statistic shows. I think it's, it's multifactorial. I don't think it's just that. I don't think we have an answer exactly why our incidence is so high. Okay. Um, number two, for example, is District of Columbia. It's not clear why District of Columbia mm. would be so high either. Yeah, you couldn't get much different in demographics, exactly. um, lifestyle than New Hampshire versus exactly. DC. Exactly, exactly. Huh. So urban versus more versus rural. rural. That's yeah. that's my point, exactly. right? Um, I don't have an answer for that. I'm not sure that anyone does. I'm sure people are looking into this, but um, having that statistic, I think we need we need to react to it in a way that we take care of our patients and we screen them. Right, right. Well, Dr. Feldman, in a little less than a minute, we're going to be cutting away for our first break. Mm -hmm. And when we get back, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, maybe a a little bit more about your model in detail, the clinical side, the imaging side, um, getting into some of the screening and diagnostic imaging that's done and some of the guidelines. Uh, Dr. Marina Feldman of the Elliott Breast Health Center, a breast radiologist, is here to answer any questions that you might have about breast health in general or specifically maybe about breast cancer. The number is 603-669-1370. Again, that's 603-669-1370. We'll be right back. People are finally doing something about the rising cost of their health insurance. They're switching to Minuteman Health. Minuteman Health could save you $1,000 to $5,100 a year on your premiums. Enroll at MinutemanHealth.org. Savings based on HealthCare.gov comparison of the lowest cost 2016 silver plans for all carriers in 03215 for a family of four, two adults age 40, and two children under 21, all non-smokers. Provider networks, benefits, and cost sharing amounts vary. St. Joseph Hospital now gives you more room to relax inside our new wide-bore MRI, used to help diagnose possible injury or illness. Patients who might find conventional closed MRIs difficult to tolerate no longer have to sacrifice comfort for the quality of their images. St. Joseph Hospital's new MRI unit will provide you with a faster, quieter, and more comfortable MRI exam without that closed-in feeling. We offer appointments seven days a week for added convenience, and we promise to provide your exam results as quickly as possible. Top quality imaging for precision diagnosis. 
expert care in a stress-free, patient-friendly environment. The latest innovations and technologies. It's just what you'd expect from St. Joseph Hospital. To learn more about our new wide-bore MRI, visit us at stjosephhospital.com. That's stjosephhospital.com. When your diagnosis includes the word cancer, you want your care to be the best possible. At New Hampshire Oncology Hematology, their mission is to provide expert and compassionate care for adults with cancer and blood diseases. Their providers are committed to their patients and their fight. All members of their staff value honesty, teamwork, and communication with patients, their families, and all members of the care team. You and your family will always be treated with dignity and respect at New Hampshire Oncology Hematology. To learn more about their cutting-edge care close to home, visit NHOH.com. You're listening to On Call with Minuteman Health. This show is informational and not intended to be used as a way to diagnose or treat medical conditions or to replace an appointment with your medical provider. For immediate and medical attention, consult your primary care physician, call 911, or seek care at the nearest emergency department at a local hospital. And now back to On Call with Minuteman Health. Good morning, folks, and welcome back to On Call with Minuteman Health. I'm your host, Scott Colby, and in the studio with me this morning is Dr. Marina Feldman, Director of Breast Imaging and Co-Director of the Elliott Breast Health Center here in Manchester. She's a fellowship trained board certified breast radiologist and we are very privileged to have her on the show. Dr. Feldman, once again, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's great. So uh, I'd like to remind our listeners that you are available to take uh, any calls that uh, and questions that folks might have about breast health in general. Uh, 603-669-1370 is the number. So you gave a really nice um, overview in the first segment um, about um, the model that the Elliott Breast Health Center employs. But let's go a little bit deeper into the model. model. And let's start by uh, understanding how a patient presents. And as we did in the past, we've had uh, a couple folks on discussing uh, general breast health. I want to make sure that people understand that breast health is something to be mindful of for women and for men. Absolutely. Right? Yes. So how, how would a patient present? How do they access your system? So there's one of two ways that a patient would present to our center. Um, they may enter through the clinical channel or the imaging channel. It doesn't matter because they come in through the same door. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so right. Um, they may feel a lump or their doctor may feel a lump mm-hmm. if they're a diagnostic patient. And uh, they may have other symptoms, maybe pain, maybe nipple discharge. And this could be true of both men and women. Mm-hmm. So the doctor may want them to have an appointment with one of our breast surgeons. And the breast surgeon may order some imaging or their referring provider, their primary care provider may order imaging and then they would come in. Imaging would be performed. But either way, the way our breast center is structured, mm-hmm. at the end of their appointment, they would see a doctor. Okay. All of our breast and this is for a diagnostic. This is for a diagnostic, yes. Right. So, and, and, so uh, to help our listeners a little bit, because you're going to get into screening in a few minutes, diagnostic is when you suspect something. When, something when there's to, a symptom. There's a symptom, right. exactly. It may be nothing, but you suspect something. Yes. Okay. So the definition of screening mammography is the patient is asymptomatic. Yep. The definition of diagnostic is patient has a symptom. Got it. So um, if a patient comes in and they have their imaging at the end of the imaging appointment, the breast radiologist that interpreted their imaging meets with them, mm-hmm. discusses what they found. They may show them imaging if the patient is interested in seeing it. They make a recommendation and together make a plan. So very similar to when you go in to see any other doctor. Mm -hmm. If you go in to see a breast surgeon, similarly, they will do a clinical breast exam. They will, um, they may or may not want you to have some imaging and often we can accommodate it Mm -hmm. on the same day. And then we have a powwow. We talk all together about mm-hmm. what the game plan should be and, and what next steps. And we is the, the breast surgeon. radiologist, mm-hmm. the surgeon, the, the patient, and correct. family members. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Um, Dr. Feldman, wanted to get a sense from you, and we've done a show on this in the past, but what is the importance of bringing somebody along? Um, let's let's put this, again the screening aside. Let's talk. Stay with diagnostic imaging for a minute. What is the importance of family members or support systems um, there in your facility in your in your program? We welcome whatever support network the patient needs. 
and we are happy to accommodate it. When women come in for their diagnostic evaluation or a call back from a screening mammogram, it is really up to them whether they bring someone or not. If they come in for a new patient consultation when the diagnosis of breast cancer is already established, we strongly encourage that they bring someone along because 90% of they're so overwhelmed that 90% of what is said to them by the surgeon usually goes in one ear and out the other, and they need someone who is objectively listening mm -hmm. that can um, bring them back and, and let them know. And, of course, the patient is available. We're available, so the patient can come back sure. and have a second sure. appointment as well, and it's structured that way. But in terms of the support, women that come in for their diagnostic evaluation and for biopsies, um, are welcome to bring someone along if if that if that's good for them. Right, right. Um, so that's that's good actually advice. Uh, again, don't shy away from bringing somebody in for support. So the diagnostic um, side of the house, uh, the clinical side of the house, is really if there's a symptom, and you describe the team a little bit, and we're going to get into um, in a minute. Uh, some of the imaging techniques that are used in, in some of the way that you diagnose certain conditions. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's breast cancer. But could we move over for one second and could we talk about screenings? Absolutely. And um, there have been some over the past, you know, five to ten years, some controversial recommendations coming out of the federal government and some Correct. of the specialty societies. And when I was at the New Hampshire Medical Society, I remember, I remember that. Um, and so there are differing opinions. But I would like to remind our listeners that there are differing opinions because, number one, the body, the human body is highly complex. And number two, the science of medicine is an evolving science, too. And so there always will be a little bit of disagreement on approaches. What we'd like to hear today from you, Dr. Feldman, is as a, a fellowship-trained, board-certified breast radiologist, what are your recommendations for screening? And um, what are some of the societies that might support those recommendations? Absolutely. So. First, let's back up and let me define what a screening mammogram is for our listeners. Great way to start. So a screening mammogram, mammogram mm -hmm. is a very low-dose X-ray of the breast tissue. The screening mammogram includes four views, two views of the right breast and two views of the left breast okay. that then are interpreted. Usually when a screening mammogram is performed, the imaging is performed, the patient leaves the center, mm -hmm. and then they either get a call back, meaning they receive a phone call saying yep. you need to come back for additional views, and that happens l about 10% of the time. Okay. That's the statistic okay. that is national. And, um, or they receive a letter in the mail saying all is good, everything's right. okay. And, of course, they can access this information through their See electronic chart as well. Um, so for screening mammography, back in the day, all of this used to be done on film, so it was analog mammography. Mm -hmm. Then um, in the 1990s, Almost all centers convert, um, converted to digital mammography. Mm -hmm. More than 95% of mammograms that are performed nationwide are digital mammograms. And what's the benefit of digital, Dr. Feldman? So there are several benefits. Number one, it is half the dose of the original analog mammogram, okay. the radiation dose. That's good. Number two... Because it is digital, we can manipulate the image, so the resolution is much higher, okay. and we can see better detail. So the sensitivity of the test is higher. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, should patient want to transfer her care or she's moving somewhere with her family, she can get her images on a disc as opposed to have a large folder to bring with her. And elsewhere. when she gets to the new site, the new uh, healthcare system, the quality is going to be just as good. Exactly. Yeah. They, can, they can just um, import the images and do a side-by-side -side comparison. That's great. So that's the screening mammogram. The newest in screening mammography that we have implemented mm -hmm. a little over two years ago is what's called tomosynthesis. Colloquially, patients may have heard of this as the 3D imaging. And with this... Um, Sounds really cool. It is really cool, actually. <laughs> um, it, uh, it's better detail, and so therefore it is earlier detection. Okay. Okay. Um, Instead of looking at a 2D image where breast tissue may overlap onto itself, okay. we evaluate yeah. the breast in one millimeter slices. So it's the same as looking at one millimeter pages of the book as opposed to looking at the cover of the book and trying to see through it. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, um, one of the important things that I want to uh, drive home for the listeners on this is that 
with the advent of technology, patients or our listeners might assume that with such technology like 3D imaging that looks a millimeter, is that what you said, at a time and slices it, that the computer might actually do the full analysis of the breast and make the diagnosis. But the reality is that's not the case. You, right, as a breast radiologist, you must review those slices and go through that image and you certify as a trained individual whether there's something there or whether they're in the clear. Am I right? Absolutely. The human eye and the human brain at this point can perceive much more detail than the computer models that we have. Perhaps, you know, within my lifetime, towards my retirement, my job will be obsolete, <laughs> but uh, but not yet. Right. Um, and the, the benefit of that uh, we use, it's called CAD, Computer Assisted Detection. Yep. Um, And it's not yet available for tomosynthesis for our 3D studies, but for 2D studies, we utilize that routinely. And a physician must interpret this type of an image, correct? Absolutely. Right. So it it has to be done by a physician. Absolutely. And and then, of course, the training is what separates um, various centers from one another. In in your center, you're fellowship trained, which is the highest standard you can achieve. All of our breast radiologists are fellowship trained. Okay, great. So, um, so 3D imaging, yep. very cool, yep. and you're employing that virtually across the board unless there are coverage are. issues with insurance. We are. Okay, great. So um, in terms of the dose, the, the patient should be aware that the dose of radiation with the 3D tomosynthesis is higher than a digital, okay. but still lower than the analog that everyone was getting prior to the 1990s studies. Okay. Um, but the benefit, with, as with anything in life, there's a cost-benefit analysis that goes on. And, of course, the benefit of earlier detection, right. we feel far supersedes the incremental um, increase in radiation. So I have a couple of, for examples. Sure. So, Could I just ask one quick question? And I think this is, uh, you know, Captain Obvious here with this question, but I would only assume that that individual who moves out of the area and goes to a different health system can take his or her 3D image with them as well. It's portable just like Absolutely. a digital? Absolutely. Okay, yes, cool. it is portable. Cool. Yes. Yep. So the dose equivalent of a screening mammogram is the equivalent of flying 1,000 miles. So if you get in a plane in Manchester and you okay. go to Los Angeles and back. I love these. St- you did a little homework last night, Dr. Or, Feldman. <laughs> well, I actually, I, have, I, I give these to my patients okay. because they ask these questions. Okay. Um, the same as driving about 300 miles. Okay. The same as biking 10 miles. Or... This is my favorite one, breathing New York or Boston air for about two days. Luckily, our air up here in New Hampshire is much cleaner. <laughs> okay. But the go- my, my point is that against the background radiation that we're surrounded with in our modern society, yep. this is a very, very small parcel, and the benefit of early detection far outweighs it. Right, absolutely. So getting back to then... Um, when you, you've defined uh, the different modalities, if you will, that it can be used for screening mammography, what are the guidelines? How frequently should a woman, uh, I guess a woman, go? Yeah, so men are not screened. Men would only have a diagnostic study if there's a problem that they feel or their doctor feels. But I sort of knew that, but thank you for clarifying No problem. That. <laughs> um, in terms of the screening, our recommendation uh, the recommendation of Elliott Breast Health Center that is supported, and I'll explain by whom and why, is yearly mammography starting at 40. Okay. Um, the U.S. Prevention Task Force came out with recommendations in 2009 saying don't screen before 50, okay. don't screen after 75, and only screen every other year between 50 and 74. Um, we strongly, we being everyone who is involved in breast health, strongly disagree because one in six cancers occur in women in their 40s, so not screening that population would be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Even the recent American Cancer Society recommendations recommend yearly screening for women between 40 and 50 because that uh, segment of the population tends to get more aggressive breast cancer. Okay. And our recommendation for yearly screening starting at 40 is supported by American College of Surgeons, Mm -hmm. American College of Radiologists, Society of Breast Imagers, American Medical Association, American Society of Breast Surgeons, and most importantly, I think, the National Comprehensive Center Network, the NCCN. They really have the models for treatment for every kind of breast cancer, Mm -hmm. and they are really the benchmark that everyone measures 
um, how good their treatment plans are against. Okay. So they're really kind of our lighthouse, if you will, right. that everyone should. No, absolutely, and, and you have some really powerful organizations behind those those guidelines. So, Dr. Feldman, we are actually going to cut away to break right now, and when we come back, let's, um, let's go back over and let's talk about uh, the diagnostics again. And, uh, and get into some of the um, sort of the higher end diagnostic approaches that might be employed if somebody, if you find something that just doesn't make you feel good. Dr. Absolutely. Marina Feldman is here. She is the Director of Breast Imaging and Co-Director of the Elliott Breast Health Center here in Manchester. She's a fellowship trained breast radiologist and she's here to take your questions. 603-669-1370 is the number. 603-669-1370. We'll be right back. We didn't start with the idea of a new facility, but as ideas evolved, they led to the Elliott at River's Edge. Elliott Orthopedic Surgical Specialist is a group of highly skilled doctors. We provide comprehensive diagnostic testing for sports injuries and other mishaps. Whether we repair, replace, or reconstruct hips, shoulders, hands, or knees, our doctors will diagnose and begin treatment plans right away. I'm Dr. Mary Lee Soule. I'm Dr. Jonathan Mack. I'm Dr. Paul Scavetta. I'm Dr. Martin Ross. I'm Dr. Rob Parisian. Our complete orthopedic team is ready to treat you. The Elliott at River's Edge is now home to the most advanced ambulatory health care in New Hampshire. It's also comforting to know that Elliott Surgical Specialists and the nationally acclaimed Elliott One Day Surgery Center are at the Elliott at River's Edge off Queen City Avenue. Elliott at River's Edge. We're ready to get you back to your active life. For more information, go to ElliottRiversEdge.com. At Catholic Medical Center, we believe that excellence in health care and personal respect for our patients go hand in hand. From our primary care and laboratory services, the mom's place, to our minimally invasive robotic surgery, CMC meets your every health care need. Our expert specialists and caring medical staff are dedicated to being your lifelong partners in good health. CMC, leading the way with heart. Find out more at catholicmedicalcenter.org. When you have digestive problems, you need to turn to a gastroenterologist who listens and responds, an experienced doctor who knows the field and can effectively diagnose and treat your needs. New Hampshire Gastroenterology in Bedford is now opening a new office in Nashua. You'll receive the same superior and compassionate care from their dedicated team of trained gastroenterology professionals who give you the individualized care that you deserve. Call New Hampshire Gastroenterology today at 625-5744 or visit nhgastro.com for their two locations in Bedford or Nashua. You're listening to On Call with Minuteman Health. This show is informational and not intended to be used as a way to diagnose or treat medical conditions or to replace an appointment with your medical provider. For immediate and medical attention, consult your primary care physician, call 911, or seek care at the nearest emergency department at a local hospital. And now back to On Call with Minuteman Health. Good morning, folks, and welcome back to On Call with Minuteman Health. I'm your host, Scott Colby, and in the studio with me this morning is Dr. Marina Feldman. She's the Director of Breast Imaging and Co-Director of the Elliott Breast Health Center, and it is a fellowship-trained, board-certified breast radiologist. Dr. Feldman, once again, great to have you in. Thanks. So um, let's, uh, let's move over from screening, and we talked a little bit about the recommendations of the Elliott Breast Health Center, and I'm assuming um, that most centers throughout New Hampshire have a similar recommendation to get screened once a year. Right? I think Is, that's fair. Yeah, that's fair. Um, and so moving over... Let's talk a little bit more about the diagnostic approach and what happens, let's say, under screening with no other symptoms when you detect something that makes you feel a little uneasy. Sure. So if a patient feels something, um, she or he will be referred to us either to see a surgeon, as I mentioned before, or for imaging. Mm -hmm. So since we're discussing imaging, let's concentrate on diagnostic imaging. So a patient would come in, and we would put a marker, a little sticky marker, um, over the area of concern, and we would take the... um, And that's determined by physical examination by you, working with a patient to determine where... So, no, actually, the marker is placed where the patient the patient identifies the area. Got it. The mammography technologist will put a marker over the area so that I can see that area on the mammogram. Got it. So that when Got mammographic it. imaging is performed, I know what area to concentrate on, what area I evaluate, all of it, of course, but what area kind of to hone in on. Okay. And we may need some additional diagnostic views to take a closer look at that area. Mm-hmm. If that area has calcifications, 
we may need magnification views. And what is a calcification, Dr. Feldman? So it's just that it's a deposit of calcium. Okay. And there are different causes for there are many different causes for calcium in the breast. Um, but what we're concerned about is the kind of calcifications. They're very, very small. There's the size of chalk dust. Wow. And they may be the tip of the iceberg. They may be an indicator of bad cells, cancer cells in the lining um, of ducts that go throughout the breast. Okay. So we may need additional rolled views if there is some asymmetry. When I was training and tomosynthesis was not as popular as it is now. Again, the, that's the 3D. The 3D imaging, yep. yes. Um, we did a lot of spot compression views, which were not very comfortable. We use those much less now. What is that? Could you just explain Sure. That? A spot compression is really when you squish. Mammography is not comfortable anyway. Any woman that's had it will tell you it is not a comfortable examination. It's okay. almost like a necessary evil. But spot compression will allow us to give more pressure to a particular area, an area of concern, yep. to see if it's just tissue. It will spread out on two-dimensional imaging. Okay. And if it is not just tissue, if there's a mass there, it's not going to spread out. So you take an image of that spot compression exactly. to see how the tissue underneath is reacting exactly. to the, to to the pressure. Exactly, to increase pressure. Got exactly. It. Okay. Exactly. So... After the diagnostic imaging is a diagnostic mammographic imaging is performed, we may or may not need supplemental ultrasound. If patient presents with something that she's feeling or nipple discharge or focal pain, so mm -hmm. a specific area of pain, we will go to ultrasound and take a look at just that area sonographically. So, Dr. Feldman, when, when you and I were preparing, and, and the, the regular listeners of the show know that I meet with the guests not to rehearse, but to prepare and to, to really get sure. a roadmap. But I had asked you this question. I was wondering if uh, I'll, I'll ask it again. Yep. Why is an ultrasound used for screening purposes? You told me, I believe, that the gold standard is mammography. It is. It is. And the reason for that, so let me back up. There is a way to evaluate all of the breast tissue using ultrasound. Mm -hmm. It's called automated breast ultrasound, and actually our center has it and we utilize it. We have an ABVS, which is automated breast volumetric um, scanning. Okay. That is a 3D way to look at the breast using ultrasound. The reason that is not the standard of care for screening, for screening is because the calcifications that I, me that I mentioned are very important. They are okay. the earliest indicator of the most common type of non-invasive breast cancer. So you really want to diagnose something at its kind of uh, very neonatal stages yeah, yeah, um, right. before it comes to clinical attention because there's already a palpable mass. An ultrasound just can't pick up on that chalk dust sized Exactly, exactly. Okay. The best way to visualize calcifications and evaluate them is to use mammography. Perfect. So getting back, uh, sorry to derail yeah. your train of thought, but, but getting back, so, um, so you might have done a, a spot compression um, yep. image. Um, you might see something. You might follow up again with the ABVS, which is that. Um, well, no, we would follow up with just a regular ultrasound. Okay. Um, ABVS, we use... Um, as part of screening high-risk population Got it. in okay. conjunction with screening mammography. And we can get into high-risk screening a little bit, yeah. if time allows. Sure. So um, we would do a targeted ultrasound, a focused ultrasound of the area of concern. Okay. Um, the sonographer would scan. Our breast radiologists go in, and if they feel the need, they scan themselves. All okay. of them know how to scan themselves. And then they have a conversation with a patient, and they say, this is what we see. This is what we think. This is what we recommend. A lot of times it's, it's just tissue. It's a cyst. A cyst is just a sack of fluid, basically. It's mm -hmm. a mass that's filled with fluid. You're fine. We'll see you in a year. Or it may be something that requires a biopsy. We have a conversation about what to expect from a biopsy. Or it may be something that we are almost 100% confident but not quite, 98% confident sure. that it is benign, and we want to be careful and we want to follow it in six-month time. So those are really the three outcomes of a diagnostic evaluation. Okay. Either you send the patient back to screening mammography yearly, you follow something in six-month time, or you go to a biopsy. 
even with a biopsy, it doesn't have to be cancer. There are a lot of things um, that happen in the breast that mimic cancer mm-hmm. that are not, and you can't be sure, and you want to prove it as opposed to guess it. Right. And when we were uh, speaking earlier, you had mentioned um, the calcification and that there can be, while that could be a precursor of cancer, calcification can occur for many reasons. Is that right? Yes. And what causes some calcification? So you may have calcifications in your breast due to trauma. You may have it just as a benign process with age. There are some dystrophic calcifications uh, or secretory calcifications. These are technical terms, Mm -hmm. but they look differently on a mammogram. So we are able to assess them and say, no, that's okay. There could be vascular calcifications in a patient that has high cholesterol or maybe renal disease, kidney disease, the vessels of the breast would also demonstrate some calcium deposits or atherosclerosis. Okay, okay, and I think we're, we're familiar with that term as well. Um, when we were talking also, Dr. Feldman, before we get into um, sort of the next step after you've identified something that you want to take a closer look at, um, we got we got into the topic of dense breasts, and as mm-hmm. you and I agreed, that's probably an entire show, yes. right, in and of yes, itself. Indeed. But could you just um, help educate me again and our listeners on what are really the four types of breast tissue that are most common in, in women? It's it's not really that there are four types. It's more that it's a spectrum, and okay. in, in an effort to... Um, facilitate categorization, we have labeled them as either predominantly fatty breast tissue, scattered fibroglandular breast tissue. And what does that mean? Scattered means there are some glandular tissue that is scattered against the background of fatty tissue. Their next uh, category would be heterogeneously dense breast tissue. That's when between 50 and 75% of the breast contains dense glandular tissue. And so it is more likely, that tissue is more likely to mask an underlying mass. And then there's a category of extremely dense breast tissue where the likelihood of masking is even higher. Okay. Tomosynthesis, the 3D imaging that yep. we discussed, definitely gets at that and helps us with screening with increased confidence the extremely dense breast parenchyma population and the heterogeneously dense breast parenchyma population. About 30% of patients have dense breast tissue. That's just how they're made. Mm -hmm. Mammogram, we have a saying, mammogram is like a fingerprint. They're extremely unique. No two women are alike. It is really that specific and and unique so it's part of it is how you're made and part of it is the exogenous factors so hormones and other things depending where you are in your um life cycle if you're 20 or 40 or 70 your breast tissue will look a little different so a quick question for you about the worry factor associated with what we're talking about um for a woman who maybe has a dense breast um and is in her 50s or 60s, she's sort of used to the drill, I would assume, if she goes every year. But for a woman who comes in for the first time at age 40 and is screened and it's determined um, that she has what are characterized as dense breast, there's it's just really her physiology, right? It doesn't mean she's at higher risk for anything just because she has dense breasts. Is that a safe statement? It's it's both. It's her physiology and it's just her architecture. That's just how she is. But it doesn't place her at risk. That's my it, question. It's, da- it's not that it raises her. There's some studies that are being done at that. So that okay. used to be a fair statement. There's more question around that statement now. So women that have high, that have um, extremely dense breast tissue, we sometimes use adjunct screening studies mm-hmm. such as ABVS or MRI that's also used for additional screening. Um, There are studies that are being done now, and it looks like the more glandular tissue you have, the more there's a potential that something will develop because cancer develops in glandular breast tissue. Great. And, again, that gets back to the statement I made earlier that the the science of medicine is an evolving science. Dr. Feldman, we're up against break, so we're going to cut away right now. And when we come back, let's talk about some of the diagnostic procedures that you do that don't necessarily involve a machine, right? Um, Sure. 603-669-1370 603-669-1370 is the number. Dr. Feldman is here to answer questions you might have about breast health and breast imaging. We'll be right back. People are finally doing something about the rising cost of their health insurance. They're switching to Minuteman Health. Minuteman Health could save you $1,000 to $5,100 a year on your premiums. Enroll at MinutemanHealth.org. 
Savings based on healthcare.gov comparison of the lowest cost 2016 silver plans for all carriers in 03215 for a family of four, two adults age 40, and two children under 21. All non-smokers. Provider networks, benefits, and cost sharing amounts vary. At Catholic Medical Center, we believe that excellence in health care and personal respect for our patients go hand in hand. From our primary care and laboratory services, the mom's place, to our minimally invasive robotic surgery, CMC meets your every health care need. Our expert specialists and caring medical staff are dedicated to being your lifelong partners in good health. CMC, leading the way with heart. Find out more at catholicmedicalcenter.org. We didn't start with the idea of a new facility, but as ideas evolved, they led to the Elliott at River's Edge. I'm Dr. Joe Guanasha. There was a lot of talk about this being the right time for urgent care. It's a perfect choice to treat illnesses, accidents, or injuries, or when your doctor's office is closed. I'm Dr. Kevin Rankins. No one wants to take up time in an emergency room when others might need that time for life-threatening injuries. Urgent Care quickly gets you to a board-certified emergency doctor. These days, making urgent care easily available and accessible means health care is less expensive for all of us. Urgent Care is a great option when you don't need an emergency room visit. I'm Joanne Waska-Cormier, LPN. Urgent Care at the Elliott at River's Edge. It's faster than an emergency room visit. You're going to love our care. Urgent Care is open from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day. No appointments necessary. Located right off Queen City Avenue at the Elliott at River's Edge. For more information, go to ElliottRiversEdge.com. You're listening to On Call with Minuteman Health. This show is informational and not intended to be used as a way to diagnose or treat medical conditions or to replace an appointment with your medical provider. For immediate and medical attention, consult your primary care physician, call 911, or seek care at the nearest emergency department at a local hospital. And now back to On Call with Minuteman Health. Good morning, folks, and welcome back to On Call with Minuteman Health. I'm your host, Scott Colby, and in the studio with me this morning is Dr. Marina Feldman. She's the Director of Breast Imaging and Co-Director of the Elliott Breast Health Center. She is a fellowship-trained, board-certified breast radiologist, and she is here talking about breast imaging. Dr. Feldman, once again, thanks for joining us. It's fun. It is fun, and guess what? This is our last segment. And as I always say to my guests, and the listeners will attest, it flies. So... When we went on break, I said, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about some of the things that you do that don't necessarily require that imaging machine. But actually, everything you do requires that imaging machine. But sometimes you find it necessary to get a sample. And if you see something in the breast, maybe a little cyst or something, you want to actually get a piece of the tissue and have it tested. Why don't you talk about the different ways that that occurs and and help educate us? Sure. So... Getting the tissue sample is called getting a biopsy, doing mm-hmm. a biopsy. Yep. And there are different kinds of biopsies that we do. Okay. Uh, first, I'll describe a biopsy that... Uh, and you're involved in all of them. Yes, okay. absolutely. Yep. We're trained to do all of them, and um, they're all imaging guided, and okay. we are trained in imaging. Therefore, we perform the biopsies. Got it. So the first I'll describe is a stereotactic biopsy. It's really a mammographically guided biopsy, and so the calcifications that I mentioned earlier the size of chalk dust Mm -hmm. sometimes need to be sampled to make sure that they're not associated with cancer cells. Okay. The way that biopsy is performed is um, the patient comes in and she lies on a table. It's a specialized table. She lies on the table on her stomach. There is a hole in the table and the breast comes down through the hole in the table. The breast is under compression, similar to mammographic compression, but not as tight. Okay. And the table moves up, and I'm under the table working, similar to a mechanic working on a car. And she's will. smiling because that's, that's the visual we had yesterday. But that's a good way to describe it, though. Yes. Right? And, and, and actually, I've used that with my patients, and they like it because they immediately understand exactly what's going to be happening. So once the breast... Can is, I ask a really silly question? Of course. Do you sit or stand during this? I sit. Okay, thanks. Sure. So it's not really, really high. It's, it's not, not like really a person's really eight high. feet no. in the air. Okay, no, thank no. you. I sit on a very, very short stool. Okay. Um, once we have the breast in compression, we take two pictures, 15 degrees from the middle, and that's where the stereotactic, the name stereo meaning two, comes okay. in. Mm-hmm. So based on those two images, we find the fine grains of calcifications, and we use a computer software to target them. So the computer will give me my X, Y, and Z coordinates. If you remember playing Battleship as a kid. I do. It's similar to that, except I also have a Z, which is the depth. So I need to know how far, because it's 3D. Sure, sure. The breast is a 3D organ. So I have my coordinates. 
I numb the skin, numb deeper in, make sure the patient is completely comfortable, take another picture to make sure I didn't move the chalk dust size calcifications yeah. with the medications that I'm injecting. And every step of the way, we check to make sure that we get the calcifications that we're going in after. Can we, medication, Dr. Feldman, can medication move the calcifications around? It can just because it's a volume of fluid. Okay. So it can it can shift the tissue over because the breast in general is a very mobile organ. Okay. So I wasn't sure if the calcifications were stationary typically. or They fake. would be, but if you move the tissue adjacent to them, Understood. they will shift as well and Got their it. coordinates will change. So we check every step of the way. Once we sample, we take a mammographic tissue, uh, an x-ray of the tissue itself, of the sample, to mm-hmm. make sure we have the calcifications we were going in after. Is that a 3D image as well? No, that's a 2D image. Okay. We just need to see that the specs are there. Okay. And then uh, we leave a small tissue marker in place, kind of like X marks the spot, okay. to make sure that going forward we know what area was sampled. That is really important for all biopsy, to leave that tissue marker in place and to perform a post-procedural mammogram. So is the marker, Dr. Feldman, I didn't um, ask this when we were, sure. were talking the other day, is the marker then with the woman or, or the man, depending yes, on the case, yes. um, for sort of forever? Is it left in there forever? Yes and no. Okay. Uh, so first, the markers that we use are made out of titanium, which means no one's allergic to them. They don't interfere with your flying. They don't set off uh, okay. metal alarms All or right. anything like that. Yep. Um, and they're the size of one to two millimeters, very, very small. And they do Is that like a BB? Even smaller than even a BB. Than they're, a BB. they're much smaller than a BB, actually. So... Um, on post-procedural mammogram, we see where the tissue marker is, and that's really to dot the I's and cross the T's and make sure that it is in the area that we intended to biopsy, that we okay. went after the right area. Okay. If the biopsy results are negative, that is the patient's new baseline mammogram going forward, and we know that whatever residual calcifications are there, they are benign. We proved that, and she's okay. If it turns out that the calcifications need to come out, that same tissue marker serves as a guide for the surgeon okay. to know where to go to take that area out. So we are already prepping the patient for treatment should that be necessary. And so does the surgeon use a similar um, imaging guided technique to to get that I- if it requires surgery? So. There are different ways of localizing that tissue marker. Yeah. It can be done mammographically. Okay. It can be done under ultrasound guidance. Um, at Elliott, uh, we use ultrasound guidance. Our surgeons are superb in ultrasound training, and they actually do their own intraoperative ultrasound localizations. If they have any problems at all, we're available. We put on our scrubs and we jump in and we help, but usually they don't need that at all. It's really better for the patient to have that kind of localization. The alternative is a wire localization where the patient is awake, a wire is placed under mammographic guidance, and then she's still awake. She hasn't eaten anything in the morning, and she sees the wire sticking out of her breast. Sometimes patients tend to get vasovagal and start yeah. passing out based on that. Vasovagal so is like freaking out. Is like, like passing out, yeah. like getting okay. lightheaded. Okay. Um, so we, again, we employ whatever is best for the patient, and this intraoperative ultrasound uh, localization is best for the patient, which is why this is the practice that we go with. Okay. Um, now, another kind of a biopsy. Yep, to, so to that was back. stereotactic. That was stereotactic yep. biopsy. Another kind of a biopsy would be an ultrasound-guided biopsy. Okay. Here, the patient is not on her stomach. She's on the same um, uh, bed that she was on for ultrasound. Okay. The same position. I hold the probe in my left hand, and I do the biopsy with my right hand. I guide the the probe right over the area of concern. Yep. Local anesthesia. She doesn't feel I anything. I numb the skin, numb <laughs> deeper in. Yep. We don't feel like the patient does not feel anything sharp after that. I take a few small strands of tissue and then leave t- again leave a tissue marker in place, and we do a post procedural bio- uh, post procedural mammogram. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Very good. So you have uh, stereotactic and ultrasound um, biopsies. Is yep. that right? Correct. So Dr. Feldman, um, and and that really covers the, the way the biopsy works. And then you had mentioned the interdisciplinary team. Um, yes. Depending on pathology, and what is pathology? So pathology is a study that establishes a diagnosis under a microscope of the tissue Mm -hmm. that we retrieve from the breast. Quickly, there's also MRI that sometimes we use for screening and sometimes we use to biopsy um, areas that we only see under MRI and we don't see 
in any other way. So that's also available to us. So let's talk about how the biopsy works, and then yes. let's step back and go to the screening MRI. Sure. If we could. So in terms of the MR biopsy, um, the patient is placed on her stomach. We image the breast that is already in compression, the mm-hmm. breast in interest, to make sure we see the area. We can reproduce the area that we originally saw. If we can, same game plan. We numb the skin, numb deeper in, make sure the patient is comfortable. Place a marker in place for where the device will go because everything has to be non-magnetic to go into the MRI. Put the patient back into the magnet to make sure that we are in the right position. Take the patient out, sample the area. Again, leave a tissue marker in place. Image again to make sure that the area of interest is gone. So we biopsied it. And then again, a post-procedural mammogram. So, Dr. Feldman, what what is the benefit or when would you use, say, an MRI-guided biopsy versus a stereotactic versus an ultrasound? Is it the woman's physiology? Is it what you suspect under the screen? When, how do you it's, know what to use when? It's more the features, the features of the lesion itself. Okay. If it's calcifications, it's stereotactic. If we see it under ultrasound, that is the easiest biopsy to tolerate for the patient. Okay. We do ultrasound guided. If we only identify that area under MRI, then we do an MRI biopsy. Okay, so it really has to do with how you saw it to begin with? Yes, Is that and right? how we best visualize it. And how you best visualize it. Yes. And so an MRI, it seems to me, would be... Um, Almost the most—I don't want to say most precise because I don't want to—I I don't want to mischaracterize the other approaches, but it can see a lot. An MRI, MRI, can MRI really is see very a lot. sensitive. Um, so that's a great way of putting it. <laughs> it is really sensitive. Yeah. It, so it doesn't have to be cancer. You can have a false uh, positive, sure. and that happens in everything in medicine. So it's not that it's the most accurate. It's just it's um, a different way of looking at the breast right. tissue. And so let's go back to screening for a minute. So several minutes ago, we talked about the screening approaches, and we talked about um, the traditional, and we talked about digital, we talked about 3D, uh, we talked about, um, that's really what we talked about. But MRI can be done for screening purposes depending on the person, depending on the woman. Yes, it depends on the patient, and it depends on her risk stratification. Women that are high risk at increased risk of breast cancer, what we often try to do, we have a high-risk clinic that we didn't even get into right. um, at Elliott Breast Health Center where we follow our high-risk population closely yearly, both with imaging and surgeons. We also follow them with MRI so that we stagger our MRIs and uh, our uh, mammograms visualizing the tissue twice a year as opposed to once a year okay. using different modalities because this is a population that is high risk. And just very quickly, Dr. Feldman, again, it could be a whole topic, but what what would constitute high risk? Family history? Family smoking? history. Um, smoking is, is a risk factor, but it doesn't mean that you're high risk. Got it. So family history, genetic predisposition. Okay. We do genetic testing. We also have um, someone who evaluates patients for whether or not they're high risk. They're different models okay. um, to assess that. So family history, genetics. and Yes. Okay, great. Well, Dr. Feldman, I hear the music in the background, right? And so what that tells me is we're less than a minute out right. into the show. It has been wonderful having you in. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Folks, Dr. Marina Feldman, Director of Breast Imaging and Co-Director of the Elliott Breast Health Center here in Manchester, has been in today. She's a board-certified, fellowship-trained breast radiologist and has been discussing breast imaging. Thank you once again, Dr. Feldman. It was great to have you in. My pleasure. Folks, make it a great week.